Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Wilson Center. Uh, I have no doubt that this being Washington and uh, other people will trickle in, but we're certainly not going to penalize uh, those either in this room or uh, watching us uh, via the mysteries of the Internet. We don't penalize you for being on time. Uh, I'm Bob Hathaway. I direct the Asia program here at the Wilson Center. Um, since we are uh, webcasting this live uh, around the world, I hope you'll forgive me if I say just a word about uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center. We were created uh, back in the 1960s uh, by the U.S. Congress um, as the nation's official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, the 28th President of the United States. Um, we seek to commemorate uh, both the scholarly depth and the public policy concerns of President Wilson. Uh, in effect, uh, we try to provide something of a bridge between the world of the policymaker and the world of the scholar. It is our great pleasure today to host a man uh, whom the Washington Post has described as, quote, one of the foremost advocates of political freedom in the Muslim world, end quote. Uh, Anwar Ibrahim was, as you all know, certainly don't need this introduction, so I'm going to be brief, but uh, Anwar Ibrahim was Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia from 1993 through 1998, uh, serving under Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad, uh, the longtime and controversial Malaysian leader. Uh, Mr. Anwar served simultaneously while he was Deputy Prime Minister as Finance Minister of his country at a very turbulent time in the economic and financial history of Asia. Um, during his years as Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Anwar became increasingly known around the world for his attacks, even his outspoken attacks on nepotism, cronyism, and corruption, uh, and his efforts to reform Malaysia, reform the Malaysian government, uh, and even uh, his own political party, uh, the powerful UMNO. The Prime Minister, Prime Minister Mahathir, eventually tired of uh, Mr. Anwar's suggestions and criticisms and had uh, his Deputy Prime Minister dismissed from office in 1998 um, and subsequently charged with sodomy and corruption on what many independent observers viewed as politically motivated, trumped-up accusations. Be that as it may, the former Deputy Prime Minister was tried, found guilty, and imprisoned for six years, uh, only to have the Malaysian courts uh, overturn the conviction and free him from prison on the grounds that uh, the testimony against him had been coerced. Stanwar subsequently re-entered the political arena was re-elected to his old seat in Parliament, uh, and today is the leader of the parliamentary opposition in Malaysia. Uh, he is with some frequency described as the Prime Minister in waiting. Uh, two years ago, he was again charged with consensual homosexual sodomy, uh, in a, another case that many analysts have described as a politically motivated proceeding, and he is uh, awaiting trial on these latest accusations. Uh, Mr. Anwar, the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, is delighted to host you today. We're eager to hear what you have to say. Uh, Mr. Anwar has agreed to, uh, following his prepared comments, to take questions from the audience. Um, so he'll speak for perhaps 20 or 25, uh, maybe 30 minutes, and then we will invite those in the audience to become involved in this discussion. 
So join me, if you will, in welcoming our guest. And Mr. Anwar, I invite you to the podium. As we say thank you, terima kasih, Bob, uh, for the introduction and kind introductory remarks for a change. Uh, I don't use to get such a wonderful introduction in Malaysian parliament. Um, and of course, the Woodrow Wilson Center, I recognize the presence of many of my old colleagues and friends. Um, let me start with the proposition that there is generally no problem between Islam and, and democracy in Southeast Asia. The general notion is that Islam and democracy are essentially at loggerheads. And this is the discourse that I find uh, while teaching here at Science and uh, Georgetown University. Um, it is said, or alleged by some, that while democracy liberates Islam incarcerates. Democracy delivers people from the bondage of tyranny. Islam sends them back. They also say that democracy liberates by granting freedom of conscience, while Islam enslaves by imposing ideological rigidity and robbing people of their individuality and free will. And as if all this is not bad enough, we are told that while democracy gives us dignity, Islam gives us violence and terror. These generalizations have provided Islamophobia, particularly post 9-11, new vigor and strength, frenzied and irrational it may be. The tragedy is that many people are buying it and places and countries once considered to be more tolerant and liberal are now becoming more chauvinistic and xenophobic. So why, in spite of the dichotomies as typified, do I still say that there is no problem between Islam and democracy in Southeast Asia? Perhaps there is essentially no problem in terms of compatibility between the two in the region. Certainly not a foundational problem which would make one cancel out the other in order for a state to be governed according to the requirements of a constitutional democracy. Perhaps at a different forum, we may discourse about the Islamic foundations of democracy and freedom, as expounded back in the 10th century by the great Muslim philosopher Al-Farabi. But for today, suffice for us to survey the situation more on practical and empirical basis. Firstly, Islam has been unjustly vilified because it is neither Islam nor its culture, which is the stumbling block to democracy and freedom. The resurgence, the resurgence of Islamophobia, as adverted to earlier, warrants us to reiterate that Islam preaches equality, justice, and human dignity. This is because, as a religion, by virtue of the principles of moderation and protection of life, limb, property, and these are terms that is also applicable in the maqasid of the Sharia the uh, higher objectives of uh, the Islamic uh, Sharia. Islam's tenets enjoin its believers to shun violence and terror. But wouldn't the jihadist cite chapter and verses to justify their actions in the cause of Islam? That may be so. But many a religious fanatic often resorts to perverse interpretations just to justify the actions and this is not a problem peculiar to Muslims. Secondly, and in the light of the aforementioned principles, Islam in Southeast Asia has taken on essentially modernist, modernist outlook, the defining feature being its inclusive nature. Some say that this contrasts sharply with the more rigid and exclusivist nature of Islam that, as that practice in the Middle East. But I would caution against such a sweeping statement. It may be true that history has shown that Islam became more radicalized in the Middle East than elsewhere, but that should be viewed in the context of the geopolitical situation there. The modernity of Islam in Southeast Asia is reflected, for instance, in the adoption of the principles of freedom and democracy for the establishment of an independent state. In this regard, 
the region's transition to democracy best analysis and effectively debunks the notion of incompatibility between Islam and democracy. Indonesia, as we know, is now the biggest Muslim democracy. And in contrast to Iraq, for example, Indonesian Muslims did not have to wait for foreign troops or roadmap to make leap, uh, the leap into freedom. Here is the most populous Muslim country that had been under the iron hand of Suharto for more than three decades. This is because Indonesia's experiment with elections and constitutional democracy goes back 65 years when the first democratic elections was held. But the elections of 1955 saw an active democracy taking shape, highlighted by vibrant debates among political and religious leaders. Unfortunately, democracy could not come to fruition then, and it should be emphasized that it was not because of Islam. Hardly two years had passed down the road to democracy that the charismatic Sukarno, with the military top brass behind him, derailed the process. Labeling it as guided democracy could not mask the fact that this was essentially the abandonment of constitutional democracy for dictatorship. The late Herbert Faith, in his seminal study, The Decline of Constitutional Democracy in Indonesia, appears to have downplayed the role of Sukarno by merely referring to his, to his having fashioned symbols and reiterated the messianic demands and promises of the revolution. The fact was that he put an end to Indonesia's nascent democracy and that was not an account of Islam. Nevertheless, it is not worthy that Fifth rightly credited the role of Mashumi, an alliance of Muslim political parties under the leadership of uh, Muhammad Nasser, as the anchor of the Republic's first experiment with democracy. So in this context, we can say that Islam and democracy had demonstrated an early convergence in Southeast Asia, particularly in the Malay archipelago. Outside this region, particularly in the Middle East, the accretions of historical influence and cultural conditioning impacted the polemics about Islam and democracy and impaired the ability and undermined the conviction to bring the convergence of Islam and democracy. In fact, in pre-independent Malaya, we had the likes of Burhanuddin al-Halmi, undoubtedly an Islamic, Islamist reformist and by today's reckoning, a constitutional democrat, no less. Nonetheless, a relatively free and fair elections in the nascent democracy in Malaysia was put into practice under the leadership of the first Prime Minister, Tunku Abdul Rahman, though this was short-lived. Thirdly, Islam in South Asia was spread by traders and Sufis rather than by the sword. The famous uh, stories of the nine saints Wali Songo or Java in Indonesia, expounded in Babat Tanah Jawi. We do respects to Carl Jackson and authority here. Built bridges to Islam through cultural medium of shadow play, using adaptations of Hindu epics such as the Ramayana and Mahabharata. Now, this is quite unique because you don't find names like Arjuna and Krishna intermingling in the Islamic. Uh, ethos. Uh, you don't find them in the Middle East or even among Muslims in the Indian subcontinent as profound as you find it in Java. In doing so, it attracted adherence while remaining steadfast Muslim in ritual, practice and beliefs have also kept some significant aspects of a culture derived from other religions, namely Hinduism and uh, Buddhism. This explains why even as Islam was spreading its wings in Southeast Asia, multicultural and multi-religious societies evolved and Muslim societies in this regard stood out for their tolerance and moderation, not chauvinism or bigotry. This inclusiveness also provides Southeast Asian Islam the antidote, if you will, to the poisonous tendencies of extremist leanings arising from fundamentalist persuasions. Again, 
using the largest Muslim democracy as a case study, the era of reformasi saw the people of Indonesia organizing themselves into various political parties with some radical agenda, including the establishment of Islamic State. After all, it's a free a democratic nation with a free media. You must allow all uh, tendencies and religious persuasions, including those that call for uh, Islamic reform or the application of the Sharia or establishment of Islamic State. But the strength is this. When the nation went to the polls, they rejected outright the radicals. This phenomenon shown, shows that Muslims can and in fact do reject not only extremism, but any semblance of an exclusivist Muslim polity. This nails the lie to the notion that democracy and freedom in a majority Muslim nation can easily be hijacked by extremists and radicals. But of course I'm not suggesting that Muslims in the region comprise a united monolithic bloc without any shade of difference. Uh, you have uh, differences, no doubt, but the cliched portrayal of the bifurcation of Muslims into strict Islamists or conservatives on the one hand, secularists and liberals on the other, is no longer tenable. I believe that these two categories, even if they may be so pigeonholed, uh, occupy only the fringes of an overall entity which uh, comprises largely moderate Muslims. Uh, I don't think Indonesian universities study um, the uh, religion of Java in the same context that this was used as a basic text in the 60s and the 70s. However, I concede that this argument cannot be stretched too far because terrorism respects neither principles nor ideology. Aceh, the southern Philippines, and now more particularly the explosive situation in southern Thailand are exceptions of grave concern. In addition to the vicious cycle theory, it may be further observed that certain segments of a society become radicalized and resort to terror and violence. But this in the context of Southeast Asia, Aceh, the Moros of southern Philippines, and Patani in southern Thailand. Without um, exception, most uh, studies, observers, attribute it to the issue problem of social and economic marginalization. Even the, the, then, the thesis has limited application. The Bali bombings in Indonesia of recent memory had less to do with socioeconomic factors than with the messianic underpinnings of zealots bent on bloodshed and destruction. But there's a caveat to that. Unlike the bombings in other parts of the world, Muslim world or India, the Bali and Jakarta bombings was uh, overwhelmingly rejected and condemned, almost without exception, by all religious scholars and Muslim groups, to the extent that very fast, very quick enough, the security forces could chase after the perpetrators of the crime without much difficulty, because no villager wanted in any way to be associated or to be seen to be condoning the perpetrators of this crime. And this, to my mind, is a major exception that we here have to also recognize and study. How is it when you have a legitimate government of the people, by the people, as opposed to tyrants and uh, autocratic leaders, uh, people associate with the leadership, at least protect the system. They may dislike the president, but they want the system to survive. And they condemned and supported the security forces in tracing the whereabouts of the terrorists. So I believe the ultimate antidote to terror and violence is democracy and freedom. Of course, now we talk quite a bit on Turkey because it emerged as a shining example of what a Muslim nation can achieve if its leaders stay true to the cause of what I have said earlier without basic, uh, uh, about the basic tenets of Islam, modernist, moderate, progressive, 
and tolerant with justice and the rule of law as a motto of governance. And this is a major challenge uh, for us because uh, I hear this is uh, uh, right, certainly clear contemporary discourse and interest in the development of Turkey. And, and I think it's also a challenge not only in, um, uh, with the Turkish leadership, but leadership among Democrats in the Muslim world, here in Washington and other parts, to ensure that this engagement continue, that those who present a modernist, moderate, progressive, and tolerant with justice and the rule of law continue to dictate the affairs of Turkey. But sadly, I move on, uh, to suggest that terrorism is exploited as the bogeyman of uh, bogeyman by politicians to be used as a panic button, button whenever it is expedient to do so. I'm concerned because suddenly in Malaysia, the Inspector General of Police came out out of a sudden, there's uh, terrorist cells and uh, we always see this as a... Uh, uh, from our radar signal that some of the other political leaders may be arrested. Um, the state control media would then go on an overdrive to scare the people out of their wits. Then the State Department would then dispatch high-level officials for security talks and perhaps new security arrangements. The politicians would then pontificate about the importance and urgency of sacrificing individual freedom for peace and security. The peace de resistance of this exercise would of course be a photo shoot with nothing less uh, the experience here. And this is of course worrying. I thought that the hallmark of American foreign policy, Bob, you are the expert here, for the last four decades was the pursuit of the Wilsonian doctrine, which justifies the use of force for the protection of democracy and freedom and the entrenched civil liberties. I am convinced that I am not the only person here today who believes that this doctrine, as conceived by the late President Dr. Woodrow Wilson, is not intended to serve just American national interests, but the interests of humanity at large. Does it therefore not run counter to the Wilsonian ideals that when leaders, be they, be they despots, autocrats, or sham democrats, raise the terrorism body, America turns a blind eye to their turning their backs on democracy and freedom and their blatant violations of human rights and instead allow them to hold and entrench themselves in the position of power. Does it serve the interests of humanity at large that in return for the support to the United States in the war of, against terror, repressive regimes gain the status of strategic allies? I'm just making some provocative statements here. Don't worry. How could the prosecution of such diabolical policies hold the key to both international peace and the emancipation of humanity from injustice? With all due respect to my mind, such policies run against every grain of the ideals of the Wilsonian doctrine that I understand. I participated in the Oslo Freedom Forum early this year. There's a widespread expression of concern, in fact, of uh, not necessarily disillusionment, but close to that, of the soft approach of the administration and in, in dealing with the issues of human rights and freedom. Particularly as a Muslim, I make no apologies in suggesting this, that injustice, human rights violations, and corruption continue to plague most Muslim nations. Leaders continue to justify why changes can only be brought about, about gradually. Gradual means half a century and more. That Muslim societies can only take democracy in small doses and that freedom will bring about anarchy. And these regimes are allowed to persist in their errant wastes with impunity. If I may conclude, 
among the enduring lessons to be gleaned from our experiences is the impetus of democratization of the Muslim world can and must come, encouraged, of course, by others, but by Muslims themselves. But where this is not forthcoming, or when leaders in the region are making a mockery of it by exploiting issues of terrorism, the United States should not stand idly by, or worse, be a party to the charade. Indonesia and Turkey have demonstrated that democracy is not only acceptable, but essential to Islam, and that the enemy of Islam is not democracy, but injustice, dictatorship, tyranny, and violence. I call, therefore, friends and colleagues in the Muslim world who are opposed to democracy to change their mindset and work towards developing a vibrant community where the rule of law, justice, and good governance prevail. We need to marshal our forces of freedom and harness them so that Muslims may stand up, as we have seen in the attempts in Southeast Asia, fragile, as Farid Zakaria right, to refer to, fragility not only of uh, these countries, but also in the Philippines, in someone in Thailand. Uh, Malaysia has not yet even reached the fragile stage. Uh, we are struggling to make sure that it is strong. Uh, but we have, therefore, to stand up for fundamental dignity, for our own fundamental dignity, and establish the institutions of democracy, freedom, and civil society. Thank you. Hearing that presentation reminds me how neglectful I was in my introduction. I was trying to condense a extraordinarily diverse and accomplished resume into just a few words. Um, and in doing that, uh, I neglected to mention your scholarly activities, uh, but that was certainly an informed, uh, even scholarly in the best sense of the word, uh, uh, presentation, uh, simply reminding us uh, of another part of your life. The namesake of this institution, Woodrow Wilson, would certainly have been pleased with your understanding that American foreign policy, uh, 80 years after his death, uh, still is profoundly influenced uh, by the Wilsonian impulse. Though I can't add, uh, help but adding, um, many of us are still trying to figure out exactly what Wilsonian is. <laughs> uh, let's go to bring in the audience now, though I'm tempted to ask the first two or three or six questions, but I'm, I'm going to restrain myself. Um, we have microphones uh, here. If you would wait till you're recognized, introduce yourself, um, and then one hopes, one asks, uh, if you will please, please keep your remarks, your comments, or your questions reasonably brief so we can get a lot of people involved in this discussion. Um, who would like to uh, start us off? Yes, sir. Uh, Joe Snyder, a retiree from uh, diplomacy and think tankery. Uh, Amar, hello. Good to see you again. Uh, you mentioned in your talk that uh, diplomacy in Malaysia under uh, Tunku Abdul Rahman was short-lived. Uh, could you elaborate on the, sort of the timeline you're talking about when you feel that democracy under the Tunku uh, died or at least was greatly diluted? Thank you. Can you respond right Yeah. Sure. Thank you, uh, Good to see you. And um, no, Tunku... Um, embodies essentially a new generation of Malaysians, uh, articulate, Western-educated, and uh, but s strong fervor for freedom and democratic values. The Westminster type, not the Washington type, uh, but very democratic, London train. Um, uh, and and uh, we had uh, relatively freer media and no question about independent judiciary those days. Uh, but unfortunately, it was short-lived. It was uh, it became prime minister in '57. By '67, after 10 years, then you see a lot of resentment. Um, then by '69, the um, tragedy of the race riots, and that was uh, used as a pretext to have central power, uh, state control, because of the racial riots. So just uh, the first decade. Um, my point is. It is there. 
embodied in our constitution and uh, we have practiced it certainly well and generally well received and a similar experience in Indonesia. In fact, the Indonesian elections in 1955 was considered to be clearly w very fair and free. Uh, I used to joke uh, in front of Vice President Al Gore that clearly it is more free and democratic as compared to Florida in the year 2000. <laughs> Half of this city would agree with you. <laughs> right. In the very back. I think that's Stan, though. No, all the way back, yeah. Uh, Stanley Cobra with the Cato Institute. Recently, I read an editorial criticizing you uh, for voting in the Malaysian parliament to condemn Israel on the uh, flotilla incident. Um, so I thought you should have an explanation, uh, an opportunity to explain why you voted the way you did, and also explain why this issue was so important that the Malaysian parliament would vote on it, would want to make its opinion. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> now, um, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict though quite remote from our societies, but very emotive. And um, there's a sense, uh, not only more Muslims, but to general Malaysians, Indonesians, and uh, that, that uh, there is um, a lack of um, determination uh, on the part of even the United States to uh, uh, reach an amicable resolution of the conflict. Um, there was, of course, uh, there is, of course, no real debate or consensus what the position be. I uh, represent a view, a solution, uh, a two-state solution uh, for the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, but the flotilla issue, of course, uh, was emotive and and uh, angered uh, many Malaysians because there were Malaysians in the uh, ship, and uh, Prime Minister Najib. Uh, move a motion condemning the barbaric act uh, of the Zionist state of Israel. Um, then uh, the opposition, uh, with some reservations, uh, supported uh, that uh, resolution uh, condemning the uh, aggression. Uh, but I think generally Malaysians um, are, of course, not as uh, sophisticated in dealing with this question. For example, there's always this confusion between uh, the, the, the term Jews, uh, Israel, uh, Zionists, all seen as one. Um, but many of us are more um, concerned so that you know, there should, should not be an anti uh, or racist, uh, uh, I should say, uh, uh, a racist uh, position, uh, anti-Jews or anti-Semitic to valid criticism of some of the actions by the State of Israel. And I think I would uh, reserve the right to then express, as we had expressed in many instances, against the corruption in the PLO administration of the past. And I think uh, that is the position that uh, many of us take. Uh, but this is one issue that I think uh, the West and the Europeans and the States have to, to address too. Um, I know it's very uh, contentious, it is uh, complex, but uh, you must get to engage both with the Palestinians and the Israelis, and I share that view, to find a makeable uh, resolution to the conflict. Uh, a couple rows in front of Stanley. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alim Sitov. I'm the Vice President of the Uyghur American Association. And uh, it's a great pleasure to see you again, Mr. Ibrahim. And uh, my question is, uh, after 9-11, uh, with the start of the global war on terrorism, and uh, a number of authoritarian countries basically labeled all, uh, a lot of uh, dissident groups, especially among Muslims, such as China. After 9-11, they specifically singled out and targeted the Uyghurs as terrorists. Although the Uyghurs suffer the same uh, suffering and the same fate, just like their neighboring Tibetans, uh, who are Buddhists. But, uh, of course, uh, the uh, Tibetans receive a lot of attention and support in the West, whereas because Uyghurs are Muslims, and also because of uh, Chinese government's propaganda that they're facing 
uh, terrorist problem there. So uh, Uyghurs tend to receive less support and less sympathetic media reports as well. And uh, so I was wondering if you could comment on that, how the international community should view the Uyghur issue because the Uyghurs are basically struggling for the same freedom, democracy, and justice. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, I had this uh, long uh, meeting with Rabia Kadir, um, the Uyghur leader, uh, and uh, in Oslo recently. And of course, this issue needs to be highlighted. I mean, uh, our position must remain consistent. It is totally morally reprehensible to condone an injustice perpetrated against ethnic minorities or religious minorities, uh, be it in Malaysia or China or by uh, any uh, country. Uh, we condemn terrorist acts by whatever ethnic group, including using the state apparatus. Uh, and it is important. That is why I believe uh, in the cherished ideals, as I referred to and alluded to earlier. We have to remain consistent. There's too much concern about or dealing with the, on the issue of diplomacy purely from the standpoint of real politic or business interests. I'm f all for free trade. I'm all for excellent bilateral relations. But you can't use this. Ignore. In 2010, the atrocities committed against uh, uh, any any group of people, and the Uyghurs deserve an attention, and it has been largely ignored because you are dealing with China. I mean, you continue to engage. It's not easy, but you have to deal with it. And I think um, I thank you for for. Oh yeah, I see Rabia here. Thank you very much. It's a great lady, a remarkable fighter in the cause for justice, and suffered immensely. Right here, in the middle, and then we'll go over here. Uh, Daniel Wu from CSIS. I have a very quick question in regards to the domestic political situation in Malaysia. Um, democracy, first of all, recognizes everyone as equal, regardless of race, religion, or culture. What are your thoughts on the recent Mahathir stunt on the Bangkit Melayu incident, and how do you think that will impact the democratic process in Malaysia? Thank you. Thank you. Why do you bring up Mahathir? It's completely irrelevant. <laughs> His ideas are completely obsolete. Um, <laughs> I avoided him. You now provoke me into this. Uh, no, but there's also a trend in Malaysia. First, the Allah issue. I mean, it's a completely insane, if not ridiculous, to suggest that you can impose upon uh, others, uh, you know, non-Muslims, uh, a law denying them the right to call their God whatever name. You can call any other name except Allah. So there's a law. And Christians, I mean, here, my, my brother... Michael Bong is here, I mean, uh, very uh, strong networking among the Christians in Sarawak uh, rejected this. But this can only come from a ruling establishment or clique that is uh, myopic, uh, racist, or uh, clearly intolerant and undemocratic. I mean, in, in, I, I know uh, among the Arabs, uh, Muslim Christians, or even Jews, you know, all the three Abrahamic tradition made reference to Allah, Salam, and, um, but you have that. We, I mean, the, um, in the opposition coalition of Pakatan Rakyat, not only uh, Justice Party, the Democratic Action Party, but also the Islamic Party have taken the position, look, we cannot have this law, we must respect the rights of uh, um, the other religious uh, um, denominations or other faith to call God Allah. The, the slight history of the I mean, slight digression. You see, the Bible was translated into Malay uh, hundreds of years ago. And it's used uh, in Indonesia. When it's translated, it's translated, and the name Allah was used. Now, after a hundred years, you can come back and say, no, 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 we have to add, uh, edit the translation. You can see the thinking. Yeah, so, when um, 
uh, some of the unknown stalwarts use this. I mean, they're calling very racist line. This is Malay supremacy. This is a Malay land. I say, yeah, this is a Malay land, Dayak land, Chinese land, Indian land, whoever uh, stays having the right in this country. Of course, then um, they have now called me. You know, in 98, I was uh, a Jewish agent uh, and CIA agent. Now I'm a Chinese and Indian agent. So I just told them, listen, leadership, you please decide. You know, I can't be agents for all these Asian <laughs> communities. Yeah? And because, yeah, because, I'm, because the level of support that we get and the engagement with the ethnic Chinese and Indians. But what is the future of a country, multiracial, multireligious country in Malaysia? Well, the future is a multiracial, multireligious agenda. Does it mean that I dilute my position as a Muslim? No, I don't drink. I try, and my family try to live as good practicing Muslims. But how do you talk about freedom, tolerance, when you don't show an exercise in policies? What about your position on the freedom of conscience, on distributive justice, on affirmative ac action, which I strongly believe, I'm Rawlsian in that sense, but based on need and not based on race? How do you then accept the fact that you use affirmative action to enrich your family members? Make uh, you know, your wife and your children uh, as billionaires. When, when challenge affirmative action, I'm born a Malay and therefore it's my right. I believe that is actually a disservice to your own community. But more so, it is a clear transgression of the fundamental cherished principles of freedom and human rights. So I believe we will ultimately succeed in debunking this obsolete, unreasonable intolerant theories and people, young professionals like you should come up and fight hard. Thank you. Uh, Carl, did I see your hand up? No? Oh, John. sorry, John. John Manjo, former ambassador. John, get the microphone. Yeah. I'd like to tell a story and then ask a question. When I was in your country, Munawir Shadzala, who was in Minchir Gama in Indonesia, came through and there was a conference, and he was about to speak in English until someone said, no, 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 we want your comments to be understood by everybody in Malaysia because you are a moderate. Please speak in Bahasa Malayu, which he did. Is there much interchange among the countries of Southeast Asia, the, the Muslim communities, majority or not, to try and reinforce their moderation, their, their views, as you've expressed them? Not enough is being done. There have been exchanges with the more you know, moderate scholars in Indonesia, Malaysia, and also engaging with those in Fatani in southern Thailand and the Philippines and Aceh. But I think more need to be done. Uh, because uh, otherwise, what is the dominant trend is still the conservative trend. Moderate, I mean, they are not, they are not, they are not uh, radical in many ways, but a new conservative uh, trend interpretation of religion which to my mind is rigid and which is uh, not promoting the whole principle of uh, creative thinking, which uh, we term as ijtihad, opening the gates and, that, uh, and, and doors for discussions and discourse. Once you allow the principle of freedom for discussion and discourse, then people are bound to you know, transgress some rules and debate and discuss. You have to accept that as reality. If you want to talk about freedom, but people must only say uh, and, and interpret the manner you would want to do it, or the, the, the formal and um, dominant uh, view, then I don't believe that we can have freedom in that regard. Yes, sir. Here and then here. Excellent. Thank you. Kaya Maile from the Council of uh, Community of Democracies. Um, to what extent um, does the philosophical foundations of Islam inform the cultural assumptions of the Islam fundamentalists and conservatives in interacting with governments outside the Orient? The reason why I'm asking this, there is a book by Professor Mamhud Mamdani, Good Muslims and Bad Muslims. And one of the things that he seems to suggest is that the philosophical underpinnings and foundations of Islam have great implications when it comes to the cultural assumption. And one of those implications is that when this uh, bad Muslim interact with someone outside the Orient, sees this person from the position of the other. Thank you. Mm. 
Very complex question. <laughs> uh, You'll have to draw on your scholarly yeah. resources. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> very strong philosophical uh, uh, discourse here. But, but I don't, uh, I mean, generally as, as a f um, philosophical construct, uh, don't um, uh, share the view, uh, particular religion, religious understanding, Islamic understanding, too quick in terms of uh, the good and the ugly, the bad and the good when it comes to a religious discourse. Uh, then you take a more, not philosophical, but to a legalistic uh, a viewpoint. I don't. And I think in the discourse, you encourage uh, reason and you, you tolerate uh, differences. But I believe that uh, the fundamental core must be well expounded. People say, Anwar, what are you? Do you support secular state or do you support an Islamic state? If uh, I don't support Islamic state uh, because it's interpreted by so many in <coughs> negative contexts. By if Islamic state you mean freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, rule of law, then fine with me. Do you support a secular state and secular or secular like Cité of France, secular like uh, America, America, New York or America, Virginia? So, um, so normally I avoid these labels. I would prefer that you go through uh, and explain the fundamental principles. What do you want? Then I say, okay, what I will not compromise is the constitutional guarantee, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, rule of law, free media, uh, you know, market economy, really such subject. This is better. Then where does religion come to play? Okay, then you, re you have to respect. Uh, if uh, Muslims uh, uh, want to have uh, proper Sharia courts for family law, divorce, as, uh, uh, in a limited sense, to me it's fine. But do not encroach on the rights of others. Do not use religion to compel your belief. And this, the, the contentious debate on issue of conversion, apostasy, becomes there. Because when you use religion to compel. But otherwise, what is religion? The relevance is for peace, for tolerance, for justice, for order. And, and because of that, you must accept the, the, the uh, uh, differences, cultural differences. I give a small example here in Indonesia, which I had a big debate with my great uh, brother, Guzdur, Abu Rahman Wahid, a great fine man. Um, you see over phonography in, in Indonesia. Uh, it's democratic. They believe in f and cherish freedom, but a strong debate at the limits uh, phonographic uh, material should be allowed. I would say, what's your decision? I say, let them decide. Let them debate, argue, quarrel, and come up with the legislation. What are the limits that you have? Now, some of my friends here in Washington at that time was very strong. How do you call your country democratic and free when you want to have a legislation against phonography? This is uh, the, the problem. You want to dictate the language of discourse, even specific policies, that it must necessarily uh, agree uh, with you in its entirety. No. What is fundamental, even my understanding was only in ideals, is the fundamental principles of freedom. And you must allow for some latitude for people with different cultures, different religious uh, sensitivities, to navigate their own style and way. Otherwise, you just adopt entirely the constitution here to be applicable in other countries, which is not possible to my mind. Hi, my name is Roya, I come from Dubai. My question is that uh, before we, any Islamic country, uh, arrives to democracy, what is the transition period that they need? What are the chances they should be given? How it should be viewed in terms of, of course, they would go t through trial and error. So not to be judged and the tolerance level before they arrive at democracy. And this, because democracy means different, it would interpret differently in different countries or for different regions culturally, uh, religion-wise. So I'd like your views, please. Mm, thank you. You see, this issue of transition to democracy, that question should be asked 50 years ago in most of the Muslim countries, and particularly the Middle East. Because otherwise, after 60 years of independence, or after 60 years of, uh, you know, exit of the British Raj, or uh, Algerian Revolution, now you see, you know, we are just in nascent stage. You know, our people are not prepared. Because our people need to be educated, and to be given adequate exposure. 
then my answer is that you have to go and let the other people decide and then and, and, and give this opportunity. If you have been there leading the country for the last three decades under the same obsolete regime or system for 60 years and your people are still not ready, then you need to go. I mean, that, that should be my main principle, you know. Because uh, um, that is what my concern. I know the, the, the question is relevant and legitimate. They say that uh, uh, democracy entails what? You must have a free media. What is the strength of democracy, although new, is not as fragile in Indonesia as in many other countries? Peace, security, you have that in Indonesia. Uh, you have a free media. There's a big battle to demand that they establish independent judiciary. Uh, there's anti-corruption commission. It's a huge battle and debate whether it is truly independent and tackle the issue of corruption. There's a big debate on economic policies, whether you want to just to propel this obsession and the mantras about privatization, deregulation, you know, the mantras of the IMF, or propel economy, market economy, but at the same time cater for the marginalized, the poor with adequate emphasis to the principle of distributive justice. If this is done, then that transition can be short-lived. Mind you, three uh, decades of dictatorship under Suharto, a decade earlier, and suddenly Habibi came into the picture as president. I asked him, why did you release all political uh, prisoners the very day you take over office? I mean, this, is not, this guy is not, uh, should be a two article in political philosophy. He's just an aerotechnical engineer. He said, Pa Anwar, uh, pa, so, you know, the, uh, respect you call like uh, an uncle or father figure, although I'm younger than him. I, I wasn't pleased I was called a Pa, but never mind. This thing is a good politician, you have to tolerate and smile. <laughs> but he said, You know, I just realize that you know, I'm answerable to the people who want freedom and finally answerable to Allah. And uh, I call up the Inspector General of Police and the military chiefs and say, release them. They say, Pa, President, we are not ready because we have cases. Okay then, give me the file. What cases? You have detained them four, five, seven, ten years without trial. I said, that is what we mean, which Tocqueville referred to as habits of the heart. It's just not fine theoretical framework, but democracy can work if you believe in it. There is a sense of conviction. And, and I think this, this um, it takes a French philosopher to understand American politics. Eh? That I still cannot uh, comprehend how. But, but that was it. Um, uh, so you must have the institutions in place. Uh? And then he worked on ensuring fair, free elections, um, the full independent debate in parliament uh, and, and continue to undertake the changes. Then, of course, you have uh, this whole team uh, and coming with uh, Abdul Rahman Wahid who showed so much tolerance and, um, uh, to, to differences and tough against um, any uh, moves or measures uh, to discriminate or, or unjustly treat the minorities in Indonesia. And I think that uh, allowed these things to happen. Uh, why is it that it, uh, we started much better in the sense it's, uh, compared to Indonesia, in Malaysia, we started much better, better infrastructure, better economic growth. But unfortunately, uh, hardly any uh, tolerance for criticism and therefore no free media. Now you have the institutions in place, the transition can be very quick. You can't allow for a transition in the Middle East for five decades after losing the ground for five decades. You mean to say these are countries, um, uncivilized, barbaric societies? No. These societies had great civilizations, great culture, huge debates on uh, democracy, freedom for decades. But ruled, unfortunately, by a ruling clique that is so blatantly corrupt and repressive. And therefore, it is uh, partly our duty to try and promote these ideals of freedom to the developing world, including the Muslim world. I'm going to um, 
step in here because I cannot resist. Um, you quoted Abibi saying that he was answerable to Allah. That reminds me of uh, Woodrow Wilson, whose critics frequently complain that Wilson uh, acted as if he believed he had a pipeline direct to God, um, and that he was an instrument of divine will uh, acting on uh, a mission decreed by God. Uh, many analysts and scholars get nervous when they hear that. Um, some um, have argued that many of America's uh, worst mistakes over the last several centuries um, have come about precisely at those moments when our leadership or much of the nation uh, believed that that a divine mission. Um, does it make you nervous at all to hear policymakers and statesmen who have to deal with very practical and even mundane issues on a daily basis, does it make you nervous when they uh, attribute some sort of um, a acting on the direction of, of an almighty? Uh, well, n not nervous. I'm certainly very worried if uh, you use uh, religion to uh, rationalize uh, all uh, you know, mundane, uh, practical actions. Uh, I, I made reference to the fundamental issue of justice that um, Habibi said, how do I explain detaining a person without due process? Most of them been there 5, 10, 15 years. How do I answer? I mean, that, that uh, to my mind, the issue of faith, be it in Judaism or Islam or, or Christianity, that's relevant. But you see that, well, I'm answerable to uh, God, and therefore I have to detain them. That sounds odd, because it sounds contrary to the principles. You see? Uh, but of course there is danger. I mean, you, you are right to caution against this um, willful use. Why I made reference to Tocqueville, for example, because the ideals and the framers of the Constitution in the initial period in the United States is also certainly embedded in Christian ethics and values. Of course, now we have Muslims, we have Jews, and, but, uh, you know, he was dealing with this question. And as a Muslim, I don't find it uh, odd because he's talking about uh, Christian ethics. I'm talking about the fundamental principles, values that is commonly shared and the issue of freedom of justice of order of uh, you know uh, and and uh, it is in that context but we have seen of course uh, the danger and we don't use it you know we, we can put uh, legislation and say you know i think or i believe it is now um, we we have to serve uh, the community in every policy all in the name of god that's where the danger lies i think uh, invoking uh, not necessarily, because this was a private dis uh, discussion when I asked him, I don't know whether he said it publicly, but that was his uh, private reference to me, that uh, invoke, but in defense of justice and human rights. Uh, you can invoke uh, in defense of uh, some other mm, interests, uh, but I think it's always useful in this whole uh, discourse on the role of religion and the issue of faith, the people rem need to be reminded that there has been as much use and abuse of religion um, to promote a particular ideological uh, or political position. Yes. <clears throat> the third row, the young lady in the third row who's uh, I've been trying to recognize for a while. Hi, I'm Zeng. I'm an intern at International Investors. So I just want to ask you about your imprisonment for six years. Um, how has that changed you as a person, and has that changed your perspective in any way? I'm Malaysian, by the way. Oh, it was the first two years, um, the, when I was much younger, then six years, solitary confinement. Now I'm not sure whether they, <laughs> whether they can survive this uh, court um, proceedings against me. How did I survive? Uh, it was tough. 
uh, solitary confinement. Uh, many of my colleagues, um, including President uh, Estrada of the Philippines, was in jail, virtually house arrest, had some facilities. In my case, the solitary confinement. But six years, when Mandela invited me, Aziza, my wife and my family, my kids, to uh, you know, visit him in Johannesburg, he was very kind, he was very, I mean, concerned, compassionate. He, was, he felt very bad, he said, I'm sorry, I know I couldn't do much, uh, I know you suffered. And I said, well, mine was short walk to freedom. Short, because six years, he was 26, a long walk to freedom, okay? And... Um, you have to have a very um, rigid, uh, you impose on yourself very rigid uh, sort of a routine. You wake up early and um, meditate and recite the Quran and start reading. So I read almost every single book I can find. The first six months they, they, they denied me and I must be thankful to many of my colleagues here in the administration then that, you know, speak up. I spoke uh, against this uh, treatment and therefore books were allowed to be brought in. And uh, in the process, I read the entire collected works of Shakespeare four and a half times. <laughs> you see? And I, not many can, can rival me on that. <laughs> uh, so there's also the, you know, uh, as I said, uh, you know, all the classics, Tostoy, Pasternak, and uh, Amatova, you know, you name it and you can find it, you start reading. Not only that, you read copious notes, you know? To the extent that after I was released, um, the World Conference Shakespeare, all these professors of English literature, authorities on Shakespeare, invited me to speak on Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in Vietnam, I said, uh, professors, I'm not uh, you know, a professor of literature. They said, no, 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 we want you to talk about Shakespeare from the prism of prison cell. Uh, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, so I... Uh, so it's just interesting. And then how, you know... King Lear, speaking to Cordelia. <laughs> so it's all, well, well, it's still injustice perpetrated against me. But um, it's faith, it is uh, conviction, I believe in freedom. And what have you learned? You actually learn a lot. Because, okay, I'm, I know, I happen to have friends all over the world. When I had this, uh, I was uh, badly assaulted to near death and um, injured my back and my face and black eye. Uh, it was there, the CNN, BBC, all over. Everybody knew. But I, when I was in prison, I realized many people, broken nose, black eye, and nobody knew. So I said, uh, well, this cannot go on. This is injustice. Not only to Anwar, but you have to reform the system. In any modern civilized state, you must start and begin by reforming the prison. You know, I mean, some were just suspects. Some uh, had no bail, couldn't afford to pay. So the, the poor suffered more than those who are, you know, known. I mean, I uh, was not given, I was denied bail. Like many just could not afford. So you, you learn. And, and you find finally, it's not because it's a Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu or Jew. or It, it doesn't make a difference. They are just human beings being treated so unjustly. So you, I believe, I grew up to, from that experience to be a better person in the sense that I, I try and um, empathize with the feeling and the concerns of others. And um, therefore now, after coming out from prison, I will never, I talk about freedom, democracy, human rights, even before, but now I'm not prepared to concede or compromise on the issue of basic right of any individual. You call yourself uh, Chinese or Indian or Malay or Daya, it doesn't make a difference. Justice, issue of freedom, is a human, uh, humanitarian issues. You must uh, be able to have the strength. If you succeed, politically fair. But if, if someone say, Anwar, you can make it as Prime Minister, if you, you downplay all the issues about justice and freedom, then I say, don't you find a different person? I'm not prepared to concede on that point. And that is what I learned in the six years of solitary confinement. We've got 
time for one, maybe two more. We're going to go to the gentleman over here and then in the very back of the room, and that's probably going to be all we have time for. Thank you, sir. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Habib. I am with the Halal Chamber. Uh, we all know that some issues are basically haram, which means it's unlawful. Some is halal, which is lawful, where there is food. The issue of gambling came up recently, and you beautifully stated how non-Muslims can still have rights in the, in, in, in the country, even though they may be minority or guests. So how would you treat, say, the gambling issue, which is obviously haram, but some people see it as their right? Thank you very much. Your opinion is highly respected. <clears throat> Uh, you expect me to be like Sheikh to give a fatwa, and no, I'm not. <laughs> no, but, but you have to understand the limits. You understand it. I don't gamble. I don't drink. Yeah. I mean, I drink water. Uh, <laughs> but but you, you, there must be tolerance. I mean, how do I impose on others? Okay. When the Malaysian authorities uh, decided to cane a young girl for drinking beer, we objected. Okay. Because I said, the most you should do is probably advise her if you want to, okay? But you can't cane when you know that um, you are not consistent. I know the rich and famous in the big hotels, they drink, Muslims, and it's tolerated. But because of a poor girl, you cane. I don't believe this is what religion stands for. And more so, I know an ex-Prime Minister, an important Muslim Malay leader, who has a controlling stake of San Miguel in the Philippines, which is a big uh, alcohol uh, beverage uh, company. So where are the, the ulama? Where are the religious scholars? When it comes to this poor girl, you decide to cane her. When the rich and famous, you not only tolerate, you condone, and you support, kiss their hands. So I think this hypocrisy must stop. Now, the issue of gambling, it became an issue recently because Malaysia has registered excessive licenses in gambling. There's, you know, all these top tycoons, the gambling uh, tycoons, and uh, um, the ruling party leaders were all in cohort. And um, in a week, for a Muslim country, in one week, is 12 draws per week. One of very, very high rate of draws. So the Chinese, non-Muslims, MPs, took it up. And I was chairing a meeting and they said, too much. I said, too much what? Too much gambling. I said, your pardon? I said, this come from a Chinese, non-Muslim. who said, I said, uh, are you serious? <laughs> uh, are, you, are you testing me? He said, no, we are serious. We, we want to stay, uh, stand up. So you can find this contradiction. This Malay ruling party talks about Islam, Malay supremacy, Islamic, etc., etc., caning people. And then one Chinese, non-Muslim stood up and said, too much gambling. Stop this new license because you're going to every single house and destroying too many families. And I condemn you if you continue to issue new licenses to people. Don't use Chinese as an excuse. Chinese are not all gamblers. So you, then the, 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 the Malay Muslim guy said, well, we need it because uh, it's important for the country. It's a level of contradiction in debate. And I, of course, stood up. I said, look, uh, it's just too much. I was finance minister. And I know what is important in terms of revenue. But you can't have uh, gambling as part of the entire culture promoted by the authorities, supporting the uh, uh, rich tycoons. So the whole uh, polemics is different here. And uh, so you ask me, what, what do I do? I said, uh, I would say that, look, what we have is already excessive. Don't start including, you know, and, and uh, encouraging it as becomes... Uh, Culture. Before it was a bit sensitive because the Muslims would demand, uh, the some Muslims would demand the banning of gambling. But now, non Muslims in Malaysia has, that, uh, has taken a tough position. The four states under opposition rule, uh, we control four major states, um, five actually, but it was um, robbed by the ruling party. Uh, and uh, one is 70% Chinese, where I come from, is the Chinese chief minister. And he announced the, the, the banning of the new outlets on a Buddhist uh, holy day, you see, on Vesa day. It's very interesting. He didn't use it as an Islamic argument. He said, as good Buddhists, I don't believe that we should encourage this part of our culture. Enough is enough. 
I don't believe that we should get and encourage every single household to have gambling. And this is a Buddhist chief, uh, Chinese chief minister. And the Muslim chief minister said, well, for now we have to allow. <laughs> I see, so it's, it's interesting that called me. Yeah, thank you. All the way in the back, last question. Thank you, Mr. Ibrahim. Sugun Wadhan Ron with Freedom House. Um, you have said in the past there's freedom of expression in Malaysia, but not freedom after expression. So could you speak a little bit about what civil society can do to open the space for expression? Um, the media um, comes under very, very heavy censorship. There's no real independent media. So at what points can civil society and journalists really expand on the existing space? I would really appreciate your yeah, answer. You. You're testing me because this is a broadcast uh, live and uh, the um, um, leaders of Malaysia will listen. So I say yes. I've never said there's no freedom of speech in Malaysia. My only problem is freedom after speech. Oh my God, that means a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm using my freedom, my first freedom. Um, there is no uh, free media in Malaysia. All the television networks are controlled by the ruling party or by their cronies. Now, I can be interviewed by the uh, CNN, BBC or Al Jazeera. No way. I've never been interviewed by the Malaysian TV network. Although I happen to be leader of parliamentary opposition in Malaysia, having control of four, then five states, and even Kuala Lumpur, the city, we want 10 out of 11 parliamentary seats. But not one interview. So that, I mean, uh, uh, well, uh, explains quite a bit. Now, print media is the same. Of course, they say you have your party uh, media, uh, 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 newspapers. But party newspapers, limited circulation. They can always um, confiscate it any time. And um, f even for the media, you have a licensing act. You have to apply for a license annually. Now, what do we do? We have to continue. Uh, issue pamphlets, get people to, to understand, and get civil society groups and organizations, international bodies to understand and appreciate. That is why I made specific reference to the softening uh, position taken by the administration on issues like freedom and human rights and media. It's not just my, it's not an Anwar case or an Anwar issue. I mean, um, whatever you may say, the United States remain important. It's an important country. And the strength of the United States is whatever. I mean, uh, I know countries and um, um, not only Muslims, non Muslims, you know, you like to, is the safest for you to attack uh, the United States, including the President of the United States. Not many are prepared to criticize the other presidents of other countries. Uh, but because the institution here is strong, but why do we then associate ourselves with the ideals of uh, freedom and human rights in the United States? Because we believe in it. You may, I may be outright critical of the position taken by many, uh, by the administration on a few issues in the past and present. I know how, how difficult it is some of these, uh, my Muslim friends sometimes coming with a scarf and being harassed at the airport. I mean, there are still some of these problems. I know some reluctance of many uh, Muslims coming here to spend a vacation because although things have relaxed quite a bit, but then that phobia is still there. But still, this is a country that cherishes freedom. You know, the Pew survey made a classic finding. You ask um, the Arabs, um, Arab Muslims mainly, um, how much uh, disagreement that you have? Well, with Israel, many with the United States, they're wrong in everything. Okay. But where do you want to go if you have the freedom to leave? United States. <laughs> you so you, you cannot underestimate it. You remember Aceh after tsunami? Aceh after tsunami, uh, before and after, the resentment against the United States is quite strong. It's a conservative Muslim belt in Indonesia. They say 70, 75%, very critical of the United States policy. Then came tsunami. Then you saw on the um, uh, President Bush at that time, I think there was uh, a lot of effort then to continue to give uh, outright assistance. And you see the armed forces went. And Paul here is aware of that. 
the, 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 the defense uh, ministry went. And they were army, in army uniforms, a number of them. But they went and observed and see without any uh, sort of a hidden agenda. Went purely to help and assist. You know, a matter of weeks from 75% anti to 75% in favor of the United States. So people are not inherently against. But the strength is because of the service of the belief in uh, the ideals of freedom and justice and human rights. And therefore, uh, we uh, appeal to the United States to continue uh, to play that role and not take a back seat when it comes to these issues. But otherwise, you know, Freedom House and other uh, setups, and uh, I will, of course, uh, uh, have to whisper to Bob to expect uh, the center here to do certainly much more in Southeast Asia. I mean, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and uh, Palestinian territories uh, are still very important. Um, but I don't think you're going to solve that very soon. Uh, so, oh. <laughs> so please also look at the other regions of the world and try and uh, save us from uh, you know the cruelties and uh, repressive measures. Thank you again, again, Bob. It's a wonderful uh, experience, and I must uh, thank you. And we'll, we'll look forward to working with the centre in the future. Well, we would look forward to that. Um. Be, be, beyond the specific things you said, uh, what I take away from this is the tone of hope, of optimism, of confidence about the future, of confidence that the right and justice will prevail. That's a wonderful message, and we salute you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We are adjourned. Thank you. I hope uh, that was fine. Splendid.